And back to our, back to our uh, story about these, uh, the operators also know this story. They also know that they lose in, in Holland, Michigan, about a, third of their, about a third of their water. They also know they lose roughly 90% of the chlorine residual, which is what keeps water from getting really super nasty by the time it gets to your house. Um, they lose that in the first 1,000 meters of their pipelines because what it does is the pipes are old and it tries to actually clean the pipes and they've got all sorts of stuff in there it does a great job of scrubbing their their pipes so what they do is they over chlorinate it's a very common thing it happens in my house all the time i live very close to a water plant you'll get in and it'll smell like a swimming pool when you take your morning shower and they're over chlorinating because they know 10 miles down the road they've lost a third of the water and they've lost the majority of the chlorine residual into that water and they don't want to really get to a point where the guy's going to call up and say man the water tastes funny or it's a different color or it's sat in the middle of the summer in a water tower and now it's almost undrinkable because they're trying to regain business from the bottle water industry on taste what was happening in the perigo is they were getting chlorinated it was fault the water then was causing them chemical challenges inside their products we run into that with brewers we run into that with bakers we run into that in pharmaceutical, where the incoming water quality is variance. It's all over the place. Some days they have tons of chlorine, other times they have no chlorine. And what they had to do to keep inside of their tight tolerances is begin to put equipment at the front of that to treat that water. So one of the things when you look at initial quality is water, especially if it's an ingredient into your products, is that the same? It was the same thing that PepsiCo ran into with their Aquafina plants, is that they couldn't guarantee the water that was out of the Tampa plant was the same out of another plant because the water variants into that. So a lot of folks, I think, go off the idea that water is water is water is water, and it's clear, and it's pure, and there's this global goodwill thing that goes on by municipalities. The reality is, in most areas, there is very little control. Inside the US, you have the Clean Drinking Water Act, which puts some pieces into place. But the reality is that's measured at the end of the plant, not the water that comes to you. It's measured at the end of the plant. And they're only required to produce a quality of water inside of a spec at their plant. So depending on where you're sitting away from them, you're going to get a variance thereof. Now, the other piece of this is, I run into a lot of folks that aren't on city water, that are on well water. This is a challenge that we're seeing now in Texas and uh, Mexico, uh, where there have uh, naturally occurring arsenic. And as we're moving into a drought condition, we're seeing, especially in, in Mexico, uh, the Durango and, and some of those areas, fantastically high arsenic levels. So if you're bringing water in from your wells in a drought condition, you could be unintentionally introducing arsenic into your, into your product. Same thing in Texas. Uh, we see the same thing. And that's the, that's the storyline here, is that if you're trying to get to a point where you have a major part of your ingredient and you're trying to guarantee an initial quality, and one of those ingredients is not at the level that you're expecting, it changes the chemistry, changes the way your yeast rises, it changes the way your products taste, and ultimately gives you that variance that you can't innovate your way out of once it makes it in there. The uh, last piece of this is sustainable manufacturing. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple of things. There's um, these little solar things on there because that's the epitome of uh, sustainable manufacturing. I couldn't tell you the factories that I drove by uh, that have those are the little windmills and things like that. Um, I, just to let you know, a small one uh, megawatt windmill has somewhere between a 60 and 100 year payment, return of invested capital payment. So if that's where you're looking to invest some money, um, the horse races might be a good option to that. Uh, because it's, you're just not going to get there. Most of those were bought under stimulus funds in the U.S., and there's a lot of other, way, other vehicles that were bought that bought those, but that's not going to be where to get it. You've got to go 
and figure out where is the usage of energy. And I'll give you a great example with bird's eye food. One of the things that they do is they have one of the largest frozen warehouses uh, in the U.S. in Wisconsin. And uh, we did three days going in. I couldn't tell you the amount of engineering time that we took. Uh, looked at everything from their process to the way they were flash freezing. And the biggest savings they had was moving from incandescent light bulbs in the warehouse to cool burning um, fluorescence. They were adding five degrees of ambient temperature with their lighting. Those are the areas, and I think a lot of guys have changed out their lightings, but those are the areas. Don't think that just because there's an off valve on a water valve that it's actually off. Uh, I couldn't tell you the stories that we've had where just putting some sort of mechanism to make sure they actually turn the water off from a clean in place process makes a huge difference. When we talk a little bit more about sustainable manufacturing, I like to talk five ways with our customers. It's one, understanding what your water profile looks like. We've talked a little bit about that already. Understanding what you're using and how you're using air. I don't think that applies as much uh, for y'all as it does you know, some of our coal fire friends or steel mills and that, but it's still a component. What's your energy profile? What's your waste profile? And what's your labor um, profile? That's how you get to a sustainable model is that you've got to understand, one, is labor bought in on this savings? And many cases, uh, I run into the idea that operators will work off of the last thing they were yelled at for. So in your physical plant, if they had a problem with a cooling tower corroding up, guess what? You're going to go through some corrosion resistance chemicals. Uh, if they've got a boiler that's causing them problems, that's going to get their focus. It's human nature that they're just going to continue to focus on those things. And, if you, and, and I will tell you this, um, if you're not looking at your chemical usage on tanks in some sort of trend, chances are at the end of the quarter your tanks are getting filled back up for you. Chances are that sales guy is going to come through and they're going to make sure your, your tanks are tipped off um, there. And so always look at those trends. Look at what are we burning from chemicals or burning through on our chemicals? How are, how are these assets looking at? And get somebody assigned to that. Get somebody that has some ownership to that because these things just aren't going to happen by accident. I've, I've been in too many physical plants to know that everybody has the thing that they feel that they've got the knowledge to affect and everything else they would just assume walk away. In fact, I'll give you an example of that. We just did a project um, with Intel and we're coming out with a product soon for monitoring um, elderly parents. Um, and GE Healthcare and our Healthcare Imagination Project said, well, we think that people that live far away from grandma will be very interested if she got out of bed in the morning and went and did whatever and in our, what our study showed is if you live more than 400 miles away, you feel like you can't do anything, so you'd rather not know. I, I, one, that's a little scary of a thought. But two, the idea is that if they don't feel like they can change it, if they don't feel like they understand it, then the best thing to do is just, well, we'll see how that thing works out later on. And then they tend to walk away from it. And that's the biggest challenge that I see in when we get to physical plants, when you get to your maintenance staff, is do they understand what the chemicals should be? Do they understand how these pieces work? Are they getting the right training? And do you have the right partners um, that are involved into that? Because that's a huge, huge labor component uh, out of that. I, I did some work with uh, Chrysler. Um, this is 2005. Paint is the number one um, storyline around initial or perception of initial quality for consumers. They all go, you look at the color of the car, is there fish eyes, is there linen in it, did somebody's cat walk across, did all of those things. And so the quality of that paint is a big part of the buying decision. What they had was a tremendous amount of foreign objects showing up into the paint. What they found is that their staff had taken two by fours and propped open the um, vents at the top of the paint booth because they thought it smelled really painty. And one, it's not a surprise that the paint booth smelled a lot like paint. Two, that created a vacuum. And it was sucking in dirt from the factory floor when the cars came in. And that dirt was settling on the cars and it was ruining initial quality. Those are the type of things that they were, they were bleeding money off of that and repainting of the cars and fixing of initial quality. 
and it took them a tremendous amount of time to go find because it doesn't show up in that meeting. It doesn't show up on a spreadsheet. It's just one guy on third shift had a great idea and a, and a two by four, and he's going to go fix this painty smell. So, so that's, what it's, that's what it's kind of about. I, I don't want to be, be negative. I think there's a lot of great opportunities. But this is why I think water is one of the most important ones. And what this chart shows, more than anything, is that there's very few green countries on the water stress levels. In fact, um, when you look at water stress, what that means, just to kind of give you a very layman's term, is that there is water that's being used and water that's being returned. So water is falling out of the sky, refilling the aqueducts, and then that's being consumed. When those two don't balance out, ideally um, what would happen is that your rain would come in, you would refill your aqueduct at the same rate that you're consuming that. That falls a little bit out of balance, you get into a flood condition. You, you get a little bit out of balance, you go into a drought condition. What happens is that doesn't account for consumption. And that's what this begins to look at is that as we see the consumption come in, it really begins to change the profile of how your supply chain is going to work, especially when you look at the number one user of water is agriculture. All of a sudden, if you guys are involved into the ag business, you're going to have to look at where are those farms at. I, I love to tell a story. A couple of times, or a couple of conferences ago, I was at uh, George Washington University. I was following the woman from the Nature Conservancy, um, Conservancy um, group, and she was she got up and she told the story of how they were trying to grow asparagus in the deserts of Peru, and how ultimately that failed. And she was talking about the plight of the, the Peruvian farmers there. Asparagus is the number one water consuming crop that you can grow. And they were trying to grow it in the desert. And, she, and I stood up and I said, you know, it's the first time I've ever followed anyone with that, with that storyline. But two, who was it that thought putting the number one water consuming crop in the ground in the desert was the best idea? Because all of a sudden you're pumping that in and you're going to get into, a, it's just an unsustainable. I mean, it just seems obvious standing here. It wasn't so obvious to them. And they're smart folks. And I'm not going to take anything away from them. But it seems obvious when you begin to look at that. This map did the same thing for the US Army. When we talk about guys that aren't into the, uh, into maybe the greatest goodwill of the world, but are into mission critical uses. This map scared the US Army to death. And they have just launched what's called the Army Net Zero Program. What they're doing is they're going to roughly 100,000 suppliers taking EPA maps and understanding what the water profile of that supplier is going to be in 25 years. And that adds into the determination of whether or not they're going to do business with them. Because if they live in an area that they don't have water, that they can't produce product, all of a sudden that becomes the number one challenge for them through their supply chain. The other thing that this does to the US Army, their number one cost is hauling water into theater. They actually helicopter in ISO tanks, 1,000 gallon tanks of water into theater. It's the number one challenge for a mobile team is keeping them hydrated. So if you think it's not a real challenge and that it's something we can continue to kind of kick the can on, just keep in mind that there's a lot of folks taking this, this, this map very seriously. And as we add another billion people in the next few years, this map goes even, even more red. And that becomes a challenge. Now, the good news of that is, is you can take it one of two ways. You can either take it as, oh, man, I need to really look at where we're doing some of these things, or there's going to be a huge amount of opportunity in different services. There's going to be a huge opportunity in the guys that go figure out the supply chain. And there's going to be a huge product opportunity that exists here on how we're going to go sell to them.